So the editors of uh, Scientific American asked me to write a piece on what would happen if we did not curtail CO2 emissions and what, what would the long-term picture look like. And uh, I thought about it a while, and it seemed to me that the best analog is the idea that we're getting recreating the kind of climate that existed 100 million years ago when the dinosaurs were around, when you had high CO2 levels and warm climates. And actually, plants grew quite well at that time, and the biosphere got along just fine. And so, uh, you know, it's a radically different world, but it's not necessarily a worse world. But you did conclude that some ecosystems particularly are going to have a really hard time. Well, well, again, this is a rates of change issue, that we got to the high or climates of the Cretaceous over many millions of years, and we're going to get to these hot climates over a few centuries at best and ecosystems and ocean chemistry just can't adapt that quickly and and so it's not it's not the climate state in itself that's bad but the rate at which we're getting there on the biology side you know in most places is the planet warms, things can move towards the poles, but if you're already at the poles, there's no place left to go. So the, those ecosystems, uh, of course, might be in trouble, Of course, but of course also they've lived through the ice ages over the last million years, so they've dealt with a lot of variability. The issue on methane release, uh, most scientists think that the most of the methane will be released as carbon dioxide and or will be released relatively slowly, and so will be a secondary amplifier of greenhouse gas-induced warming from greenhouse gas emissions, but that they're not going to dramatically change the overall picture. And this is largely because it takes a long time for heat to diffuse down into soils and down into sediments, and then also there are a lot of microbes in soils that like to eat methane. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, you can't rule out 100% some kind of catastrophic degassing, but most scientists think it's unlikely. The basic view among most coral scientists are, is that if the heat doesn't get them, the ocean acidification will. And, uh, and I think the corals are an example of a kind of ecosystem that has adapted to live under very narrow under a very narrow set of environmental conditions. And it's these highly tuned ecosystems that are really in trouble. The kind of invasive generalists, which are weeds, you know, rapidly multiplying, easily distributed organisms will do probably quite well. Um, and this gets at something I've written about a little bit, which is um, what we're talking about here so much isn't so much corals as a group of organisms, but reefs the reefs as structures that we depend on? Yeah, even in the uh, end Cretaceous extinction when a bolide hit the earth and wiped out the dinosaurs, coral reefs disappeared from the geologic record for a million years or more. But when they came back, half the species were still around. And so uh, you can dissolve a skeleton of a coral completely and it lives uh, looking a little bit like a sea anemone. And of course, a fish might come along and eat it at that point. But but uh, coral reefs are unusual in that there's one class of organism that builds the entire architecture of the ecosystem. And if you lose corals a as the dominant architects of the ecosystem, then the ecosystem basically disappears. And perhaps a quarter or more of all marine organisms spend part of their life cycle in coral reefs. And so how, how this will affect marine environments is really unknown. But it it's really not so much coral extinction that people worried about, but it's the loss of this type of ecosystem. You know, as a scientist going forward, when you step back, as you did, recognize what's ahead and kind of the basics of the, the climate challenge, what's your to-do list as a scientist? I think science, uh, I think climate science is going through an evolution right now in that uh, I think the period of the 60s and 70s is really when a lot of basic climate scientists was established. Uh, and really, I think the core of climate science hasn't changed much in the last 30 or so years. 
and, and then there was a sort of predicting that we were going to see global warming, and then we've now pretty uh, clearly have seen it. And I think we're getting into a phase where changes are starting to happen, and then and people are asking the question: Is this due to global warming or not? This heat wave that's been around the United States this year. Uh, or if when iceberg calves off of an ice sheet, people want to know, is that global warming or just natural? And so I think uh, trying to, science has moved into a mode of trying to ex explain what's happening. And unfortunately, I think the, in terms of a predictive science, the, the pre getting the details of predictions is really hard. Uh, we, we don't have a chance to do global scale experiments and to know exactly how clouds are going to respond or how the ice sheets are going to respond. I mean, we can make educated guesses, but, uh, you know, the chances that the science is going to progress so rapidly that we're going to have all the science in place before these changes happen just don't seem to me plausible. On occasion, I found myself in rooms where many of the people were quite skeptical that it's worth expending significant amounts of time and effort to address the carbon climate problem. I've said to them, pretend for the moment that we already had a carbon neutral energy system, one based on solar, wind, nuclear, whatever, that uh, provided the power we need needed without dumping CO2 into the atmosphere. And I said, now let's assume that you could be a few percent richer if you would start using fossil fuels and in return you'd get uh, you know, acidified oceans, melt the ice caps, shift weather patterns, and so on, and irreversibly for thousands of years. And would you take on all of that climate risk just to be a few percent richer? And in, in, that, in those contexts, almost nobody has ever com come up and been willing to take that trade. But if you turn it around and say, are you willing to give up a few percent of your current income in order to transform our economy uh, into one that doesn't rely on dumping CO2 to the atmosphere, then they're reluctant to do that. And so I think this shows that the problem isn't so much the cost of emissions abatement, but the, it's the, there's a collective action problem and that if everyone around us were uh, would look at dumping CO2 into the atmosphere as something that was just uh, beyond the pale and we wouldn't dream of doing it, I think the rest of us would fall into line. And it's, how do you affect the social transformation that makes us feel uncomfortable dumping CO2 into the atmosphere?